Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Welcome to Layout Building. In this episode, I'm going to continue laying track on our N-Scale Siren Creek project layout. Our N-Scale Siren Creek layout is designed to be small enough that Nicole and I can take it with us when we travel in our RV. It's also a way for me to do some model railroading while I'm waiting for the train room for my future HO scale layout to be completed. In the last episode, I put down track on the tunnel end of the layout, including the two gauge separations. In this episode, I'm going to build the first of several dual gauge turnouts on the layout and put down ties on the main line. Track laying involves a lot of repetition, so I'll be covering the construction of this turnout in great detail. I may streamline things a little in future episodes when I build the other turnouts on the layout, focusing on what's different about them. You can always refer back to this episode if you want more details. This first turnout is one of the only ones on the layout that's a standard size, a number six. Fast Tracks has some downloadable paper templates on their website. I printed this one out for a left-hand number six dual gauge turnout with the paired rails on the right side. The template shows all of the parts of the turnout. There's a lot of rail in there. It also has suggestions for the placement of PC board ties. Since the other dual gauge turnouts on this layout will be built to custom sizes, I thought it made sense to do this one first. After all, if I can't get the dual gauge turnout to work, then the whole layout concept is out the window. All of the track laying episodes use the same basic materials and tools, including Code 40 rail, PC board and wood ties, and various track gauges. If you want to see the part numbers and details about the materials, or find out how I cut and gap the PC board ties, please refer back to episodes 6 and 7. When hand laying track, it's always good to have a solid plan. I've placed the paper template on the layout in the location where the turnout will be built. I've lined up the point end to the existing track. The two tracks coming off the frog are aligned along the roadbed center lines. Note that I'm only using the template as a general guide. I'm not going to build directly on it, so I'm not worried if the alignment of the paper template is slightly off. There's a tangent section of dual gauge mainline beyond the turnout. Since there's a bit of distance to the next turnout, I don't see any reason not to go ahead and build this section at the same time. The long ties at the point end of the turnout that usually support a switch stand are called head blocks. Placing these is one of the important parts of planning the turnout. They can go on either side of the turnout. The template has them drawn on the diverging route side, but that would put the switch stand on the same side as the depot. With space being so tight on this layout, I think it'll work better if I put the head blocks toward the other side. This will unfortunately put the switch stand toward the edge and potentially in harm's way, but I don't think that can be helped. Electrically, this turnout is going to be DCC friendly. The polarity of the switch points will always match the polarity of the adjacent stock rails. This design has the added benefit of not relying on electrical contact between the points and stock rails. Eventually, I'll be able to paint and ballast the turnout without fear of messing up the electrical flow. The frog will be isolated and energized with a frog juicer, which has no moving parts. Nothing else needs to change polarity when the switch is thrown, so no potentially troublesome mechanical contacts are needed. I'll start by cutting a support for the head blocks from a leftover scrap of cork roadbed. This will put the head blocks at the same level as the rest of the ties. I've put some yellow wood glue on what would normally be the top of the roadbed. I'll flip the piece over and glue it where the template shows the head blocks. The beveled side matches the beveled side of the roadbed. Just like I did in episode 4 when I put down the roadbed, I've placed a weight on the head block support to hold it down while the glue dries. While I'm waiting for that, I'll cut some PC board ties with my razor saw and miter box. Turnout ties vary in length. The template helps a little as a guide to help figure out how long they need to be. I've moved the paper template to the side, lining up the last tie on the template with the last existing PC board tie on the layout. This will ensure that the tie spacing through the turnout matches the rest of the track. I'm using the same Type Bond 2 wood glue to put the ties down. Since it's a wood glue, before I started laying track on the layout, I was concerned that it wouldn't hold the PC board ties. It works pretty well though. Now I can use the template as a rough guide when placing the ties. My arrangement of ties doesn't quite match the template exactly. I think my tie spacing is a little broader. What's important is that there are PC board ties under the frogs and other areas with pieces of rail that need firm support. It's better to use more PC board ties than I really need than not enough. After the glue is dry, I'll put down more ties to extend the main line past the turnout. Doing this section along with the turnout will help to ensure that the straight path through the turnout lines up with the main. Using a straight edge is helpful to keep the ties in alignment. A ruler is also a good weight distributor. Weighing down each section of ties while the glue is drying helps to ensure a good bond. Just like the curves through the tunnels, every sixth tie is a PC board tie. I'm spacing the ties by eye. I think they're ending up a little broader than some commercial track, but that's okay. It visually helps to reinforce the idea that this is a branch line or small railroad. 
These are regular standard gauge ties, by the way, though this section will be dual gauge. Siding down the track is another good way to make sure everything is straight. I'll need to continue the main to the partial dual gauge turnout and put in the ties for the standard gauge engine house spur. I'll need to use one continuous piece of rail along the main and onto the spur. The partial dual gauge turnout has a curved leg and a straight leg, but it's not a conventionally numbered turnout like the first one. Because this is custom, I doubt there's a template for this exact shape. I'm using a leftover piece of N-scale flex track, the roadbed center line, and a sharpie to mark out my own rough template. I've drawn where the standard gauge rails will go. This will allow me to figure out tie lengths and the placement of the head blocks. I haven't bothered to draw the narrow gauge rails as they don't affect the overall turnout footprint. As with the first turnout, I'm using a short scrap of cork roadbed for the head block ties. Since the passing siding is on the inside, I'm putting the head blocks toward the layout edge. Since I had a template for the first turnout, I was able to pre-cut the ties. For this one, I'm measuring, cutting, and gluing one at a time. PC board ties need to be gapped to avoid shorts. I use my razor saw for this, trying to cut through the top layer of foil only. I've messed up a few ties doing this, but thankfully not many. Using a multimeter set to detect resistance is a good way to check to make sure that the ties are properly gapped. There should be no current flow from one side of the gap to the other. I've put down ties for the second turnout in the engine house track. On the end of the engine house spur, I've used two PC board ties for extra stability. I've gone back and am putting down a few ties past the diverging route of the first turnout. Now I'll continue around the mainline curve on the yard side of the layout. Just like I did with the engine house turnout, I put down one tie at a time for the curve turnout at the other end of the passing siding. Since there's no template for this one either, I used a lot of PC board ties to make sure I'd have them where I need them. Since there's room, I put the head blocks toward the center of the layout on this side. Now that the ties are down and the glue is dry, I'll give the tops a light sanding to make sure I have an even surface. As luck would have it, a single piece of Code 40 rail is just the right length to run all the way down the front of the layout from the gauge separation to the engine house spur. Using a single piece of rail here will make for a cleaner appearance. No doubt in the future I'll be taking a lot of photos from the front edge of the layout. It will look better without oversized rail joiners. I'll use a sharpie to mark the rail where it crosses the head blocks of both turnouts. The rail web needs to be filed in these locations so that the switch points will fit tightly against the rail. Placing this rail is a little tricky. I'm using a short length of scrap rail and a three-point gauge. The center mark on the gauge should be directly over the seam in the roadbed. I'll tack solder the rail every few inches to hold it while I work on the alignment. I'm using Tix Flux to help the solder flow between the rail and the PC board tie. Often the small amount of solder on the soldering iron tip is enough to make the bond. Using a straight edge helps to align the rail. Now that I have the rail soldered in enough places to keep it in alignment, I can start on the first turnout. There are a couple different approaches to building a turnout. You can start on one side and work your way across, or you can put in the outside rails and then fill in the middle. Since this dual gauge turnout has a lot of parts, I'm going to do the outside first. Looking at the template, construction starts out the same as a conventional turnout. I've cut a piece of rail to use for the outside rail of the diverging route. I'm using some 600 grit sandpaper to clean the weathering off the bottom of the rail. This will make it easier to solder. I did this with the first piece as well. I'll mark the head block location on this rail just like I did on the other one. Now I also need to file the inside of this rail so that the switch points on that side will close tightly against it. I'm using a second track gauge to hold the rail in temporary alignment while I solder the end. Since both sides of the joint are on PC board ties, I'm not going to use a rail joiner here. A straight edge is good for coaxing the two rail ends into alignment. Now that the end of the rail is stable, I can use a little solder to fill the gap. I'll set the other end of the rail, again lining up the center mark on the gauge with the gap in the roadbed. I solder the rail to three of the PC board ties near the end to help keep that part straight. I'll let the rest of the rail form a natural curve and tack solder it in place. I'm using two track gauges and a couple pieces of rail to mock up the placement of the first frog. Now I can file the ends of the rails so that they'll fit tightly together. The frog should have a sharp point. I'll hold the rails in place while I solder the point of the frog together. Before I put the frog in place, I'll file it to sharpen the point. I'll use a pin to mark where I need to cut the frog rails to keep it electrically isolated. An NMRA gauge is essential to make sure that the frog point is in the correct location. Building this turnout is a little bit of a puzzle. It's hard to know which rails to install next. I decided to put in the other standard gauge rail on the diverging route first. I'll do the same on the straight route, but I'll use a longer piece of rail. So far this is no different than building a regular turnout. 
As I mentioned earlier, it's important that the frog is electrically isolated. I've left a small gap between the rail ends. I'll insert small pieces of styrene into the gaps and glue them. After the glue dries, I can cut and file them until they match the rail profile. Now that the outside rails of the turnout are in place, I need to build all the parts that go inside. The dual frog seems like the hardest part, so I'm going to tackle that first. I'll start by bending a rail to match the angle of the frog point. Then I'll file a little on the inside edge to help ease the wheels into the frog. I've set the rail that I just bent in place and put another piece of rail on top of it using my three-point NN3 gauge to line it up. The point where they cross is where I'll need to cut the rail. Now, just like with the other frog, I'll need to file the side of the rail so that it comes to a sharp point. I filed another piece of rail as well, but on the opposite side so that the two will match up. I've tack soldered the bent rail in place. Now I can use a pair of track gauges to place the narrow gauge rail that will form the other half of the frog point. Unfortunately, there is no NMRA gauge for Z or NN3, so I'll have to rely solely on track gauges to place the narrow gauge rail. The Microtrain's coupler height gauge also has a rail gauge on one side, which is handy. I'll tack solder the narrow gauge rail in place. When I'm satisfied with the position, I can fill in the frog point with solder. Then I'll file it to a sharp point. I also want to use a file to make sure that the path for the standard gauge wheel and the straight leg of the turnout is straight. I'll do something a little easier and put in the next section of narrow gauge rail on the diverging leg. It's a good idea to test for shorts every so often. I want to make sure that the frog is isolated and that the running rails are not connected to each other. I've bent another piece of rail that will form part of the frog closure rail and switch point. I've cut the rail and soldered the bent piece to make the next part of the second frog. The next step is to file the switch point so that it will fit against the stock rail. This is what it looks like after filing. I'll also file a small amount on the top of the inside of the switch point. I always combine the switch point and closure rail into a single piece when hand laying track. It's not how the full size railroads usually do it, but it simplifies construction, eliminates a gap for a smoother path through the turnout, and improves electrical reliability. The switch points should fit tight against the stock rail. Now I'll solder it in place. The rail is only soldered near the frog. The point end is loose so that it can move. This is a good time to roll a car through the turnout. So far so good. The next piece of rail is a little tricky as it will do double duty as the other standard gauge switch point and the narrow gauge running rail. It needs to be bent in just the right place. Using my NN3 track gauge, I've positioned a piece of rail. Now I'll use the track gauge on my Microtrain's end coupler height gauge to find the spot where the rail is engaged with the diverging root stock rail. I'll mark the top of the rail with a sharpie. Now I'll bend the rail using that mark. Using the side of a fiber reinforced cutting wheel and a motor tool can speed up the process of grinding the switch points. I'll follow up with a file. Placing the rail in exactly the right spot is a little tedious. I'm using three track gauges and an NMRA gauge to make sure that I have the bend in the rail in the right place. I've had to move it several times to get it right. Now that I'm satisfied with the placement, I'll start tack soldering it. I've extended the narrow gauge rail to a point about halfway to the next turnout. I've placed the end over wood ties. Later, I'll use a rail joiner to connect to the next piece of rail. Back at the turnout, the next piece I've put in is the other half of the standard gauge frog. I'm using my NMRA gauge often to check flange clearances. I have a small file that's about the same thickness as the N-scale NMRA flangeway standard. Running this through the flangeways is a good way to make sure they're correct. I also periodically test the track with a piece of rolling stock. It'll be easier to install a throw bar for the turnout before I add the remaining pieces of rail. I'm going to use the same PC board material I've been using for the PC board ties. A quick test shows that it will slide freely between the head blocks. Clover House makes turnout throw bar ties for N scale, but they're really wide, more like an HO scale tie. There's no way those would fit between the head blocks and they would look oversized. I'll mark a cut line and a gap line on the throw bar with a sharpie. I'm cutting the throw bar slightly shorter than a regular tie, but still long enough to extend under the rails on both sides. I'll use a flat file to remove the copper from the ends of the throw bar on top. This is to keep the throw bar from sticking to the stock rail while soldering the points. I'll use a small file to set the switch point away from the stock rail. Then I'll solder the throw bar on that side. I'll repeat the procedure on the other side. Once it's done, it's important to make sure that the throw bar moves freely. Having the edges of the throw bar extend under the stock rails keeps the points from being able to move up and down. I'll check the points with the NMRA gauge to make sure that they're in spec. I had to resolder one of the points a couple of times to get this right. Now I'll drill a hole so that later I can install a wire to actuate the turnout. For the next step, I've stuck a small piece of wire through the hole in the throw bar to hold the points for the left-hand path through the turnout. This gives me a chance to play with my boxcar again. 
So far, so good. The next piece of rail is the narrow gauge running rail that enters the turnout from the point end. I'm going to tack solder it in place for the moment. The last piece of the narrow gauge frog was a little tricky to install since it's so small and surrounded by other rails. The next piece would be the combined narrow gauge point and closure rail, but there's an issue. I noticed that the throw bar isn't moving freely anymore. It looks like solder on the throw bar is touching the bottom of the narrow gauge running rail. I think this area needs some more clearance. I'm using a sharpie to mark the position of the throw bar where the rail crosses over it. Now I can unsolder the rail. I'll file a notch in the bottom of the rail below the marks. That seems to have done the trick. With the rail reinstalled, the points can move again. Just to be sure that the points are wedged as far as they'll go, I put a piece of scrap rail on one side to hold them open. That will ensure that both points on the side of the turnout with two rails are in sync. Now I can install the narrow gauge point and closure rail. All that's left are the guard rails. The diagram shows two separate guard rails in tandem on the diverging side, but I decided to combine them into one long guard rail. Since everything is wedged in so tight, I'm pre-tinning the bottom of the guard rail that goes in between the paired dual gauge rails on the other side. The finished turnout has guard rails here, 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 and here. I like to test my track as I go, so I'll try pushing some rolling stock through it first. It works. Now I need to wire some feeders so that I can test it out. I'll drill some holes next to the track to insert the feeders that I need. I'm using 26 gauge feeder wires with about an eighth inch of insulation stripped off the end. Some of the rails are connected electrically by the PC board ties, so I don't need all that many wires. By my own convention, I use red and black for track power. I put a right angle bend at the end of the wire and solder it to the underside of the rail. If possible, I like to do this in an area with wood ties, so there's less chance I'll desolder the rail from a PC board tie. I use the white wire for the frog. Once I have all the feeders in place, I can flip the layout over and complete the connections underneath. I'll connect the white wire from the frog to an open slot on one of the frog juicers. Since I'm using screw terminals for everything, I'll crimp some spade connectors on the ends of the feeder wires. For now, I'll attach them to the DCC bus here. Finally, I'll neaten them up a little with some cable ties. This is not as tidy as I'd like, and I may end up moving some of these wires around later, but this is good enough for a test. I'll attach my power supply. Now for the moment of truth. I'll turn on the track power. So far, so good. No shorts. Let's try a locomotive. I chose my Athern 260 this time because I tested it and I know that the wheels are engaged. It's working. The locomotive seems to have stalled past the turnout, so one of the feeders I just installed must not be working. Still, I'm really happy that it went right through the turnout. The engine goes through the diverging path just fine. Unfortunately, I don't have a functional NN3 locomotive at the moment, so I can't test the narrow gauge in the same way. This is encouraging, though. I resoldered one of the feeders, and now it works. While I was at it, I added a new barrier strip and neatened up the wiring underneath. That's a good place to leave things for now. Next time I'll complete the turnout by installing a switch machine under the layout. This N-scale dual gauge turnout is by far the most complicated piece of track that I've ever built so far. I'm really, really glad that it works. Next time I'm going to finish it off by installing a switch machine under the layout. Stay tuned and thanks for watching. <laughs>